Some positive news came the other day for the American people as President Trump just signed a $900 billion stimulus package. Direct payments of $600 or potentially $2,000 are going to be made to the American people. But at what cost? How are we able to afford all of these major stimulus packages? How long can this last? Welcome to the Zeitgeist, guys. It's commonly said that the US dollar is not backed by anything. So is there any truth to that? Well, for thousands of years, gold has been used as currency. For much of American history, US dollars correlated to a certain amount of gold, as they were essentially IOUs redeemable in gold. In order to facilitate trade, other countries followed suit and established their own gold standards. Because of this, price fluctuations were contingent on how much gold was mined. In order to expand the economy, we literally needed to dig up more gold. The gold standard started to completely crumble during World War I due to the need to print money to finance the war effort. The fundamental problem with the gold standard was that it was too rigid and prevented a rapid expansion of the money supply during dire situations. It's money! It's all out of money! In 1944, the Bretton Woods Conference took place and resulted in other countries pegging their currency to the US dollar, which was pegged to gold. For the next 30 years, the world transitioned off of the gold standard, hiking the demand for US dollars until finally the price of gold became untethered to the US dollar, making the dollar the world reserve currency. I have your done husband signed a NAFTA, lot. which was one of the worst things that ever happened well, to the manufacturing your industry. That is your you go to New England, you go to Ohio, Pennsylvania, you go anywhere you want, Secretary Clinton, and you will see devastation where manufacturing is down 30, 40, sometimes 50 percent. NAFTA is the worst trade deal maybe ever signed anywhere, but certainly ever signed in this country. Senator Warren, I've been go talking ahead, to Mr. Americans Yang. around the country about automation, and they're smart. They see what's happening around them. Their main street stores are closing. They see a self-serve kiosk in every McDonald's, every grocery store, every CVS. Driving a truck is the most common job in 29 states, including this one. Three and a half million truck drivers in this country, and my friends in California are piloting self-driving trucks. Contrary to popular opinion, it may not primarily be automation or trade deals that have taken US jobs, but instead this might be the result of the financial system. In the 1960s, an economist named Robert Triffin discovered that the U.S. dollar being the reserve currency had created a paradox. The demand for U.S. dollars globally will be so high that it will force the U.S. to run deficits every year. The positive for the U.S. is that it gives us much more money to finance domestic programs due to an abundance of foreign lenders. But the downside is that a massive trade deficit is created due to a perpetually strong dollar therefore making our exports uncompetitive with cheaper ones abroad. As long as a high demand for our dollar exists, we must push further into debt to keep the global economy chugging along. Since Bretton Woods in 1944, the U.S. has only balanced its budget during 12 years, the most recent being 2001. Many economists don't look at the debt in absolute terms, but instead look at it in relation to the GDP. Even then, the U.S. deficit in 2020 is now over 100% of the GDP, which is the highest since the end of World War II. The difference is, during that time period, the U.S. was the only major country in the entire world that was not destroyed from the war, putting it in a uniquely opportunistic position to dominate the global economy. Even though the U.S. has consistently run deficits, these deficits had usually been small and relatively manageable until the global financial crisis in 2008. This prompted what were then the largest government bailouts in our history and gave rise to the Tea Party movement who believed that this debt would cause hyperinflation. But the inflation never came. Why was this? Well, much of the money used to bail out the banks shored up their reserve requirements, so it was essentially just numbers on a computer screen and not money that actually went into circulation. Because the banks had this government backstop, they were able to start making loans again and actually ended up paying the government back with interest. 
In addition, asset prices had been plummeting, so the government needed the banks to start making loans in order to counteract the deflation. Because of the COVID crisis, U.S. debt has now surpassed a staggering $27 trillion. So who is buying this debt? About $7 trillion or roughly 25% of our debt is owned by foreign governments. Contrary to popular belief, Japan is actually the largest foreign holder of U.S. debt and not China. These countries buy large sums of U.S. debt because that puts downward pressure on their own currencies, allowing them to maintain cheap exports. The Federal Reserve owns about a third of the debt, and some of it is held in mutual funds, pensions, and privately held treasury bonds. A solid portion of it is also paid for from surplus social security funds that the government has taken in. Are we at risk of hyperinflation now? This is highly unlikely. Usually in cases of hyperinflation, people begin hoarding goods because they will become more expensive, therefore causing a self-fulfilling prophecy of pushing up prices. When hyperinflation occurs, the banks are the biggest losers because the loans that they give out quickly become worthless. Therefore, they will fight the hardest to make sure that hyperinflation does not occur. Hyperinflation does not usually happen in developed countries, and the most notable cases have been post-World War I Germany during the Weimar Republic, Zimbabwe in the early 2000s, and most recently Venezuela. In the case of Venezuela, prices rose a staggering 65,000%. When we talk about spending tomorrow's money, it's, just not, it's not just the money that we need next month, it's the money we might need in a decade. It's the money we will need in one, two, three generations for now, for national defense, for infrastructure. This is the money that your children and your grandchildren will pay back with interest. Will our children need to pay back the debt? Maybe, but probably not. Almost every single country in the world is in debt, and the U.S. national debt has been rising for generations. Many people wonder what exactly backs the U.S. dollar. Our economy does. People have faith in the U.S. dollar or the Japanese yen or the British pound because they have faith in the stability and productivity of these economies. In the cases of countries that experience hyperinflation, Germany had been decimated by the First World War. Zimbabwe's once thriving agriculture sector completely went belly up due to their controversial farm confiscation policy, and Venezuela implemented such strict price controls that they forced their own companies out of business. Can you characterize everything that the Fed has done this past week as essentially flooding the system with money? Yes, exactly. And there's no end to your ability to do that? There is no end to our ability to do that. How much money can we actually print? No one really knows. Thus far, running up the national debt and flooding the market with cash has not caused inflation. But we have never been here before. Our national debt and deficit to GDP ratio are both at record highs. The best answer I can give is that the debt is not a problem until it becomes a problem. But is this the way that everyone sees it? Gold and silver prices have both risen sharply this year, in addition to Bitcoin, which has actually seen its value quadruple in 2020, in part due to the arrival of institutional investors. Many people see Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies as modernized versions of the gold standard, without the drawback of needing to physically mine it to expand the amount of currency in circulation. Many gold standard enthusiasts were initial backers of Bitcoin because they believed that it could fill the role of the world reserve currency, replacing the US dollar. What do you think? Is the rising debt worth being worried about? Can we just keep printing money? And are digital currencies the future? That's the zeitgeist, guys. I hope you enjoy that. And there was a lot that I wanted to include, so I hope that it all ties together well. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed, it would be awesome if you guys would give me a like, comment, or subscribe. I look forward to hearing your feedback, and I will see you all in the next one.